Hey, and welcome to this video. Today, I'm going to talk about uniaxial compression testing and specifically issues that can happen when you run a uniaxial compression test. And one of the questions I would look into is, can you get viscoelasticity? Can you get time-dependent behavior in a compression test, even though the material is not viscoelastic? Seems kind of weird, right? But let's take a look at that uh, here in our video today. So I will start by talking about just a uniaxial compression test. So this is a monotonic test. I take my specimen, I compress it, uh, compress it to about 40% strain here. And um, the data looks fine, right? It's a uniaxial test, it's monotonic, the stress strain curve looks reasonable. But how do we know if this data is good? How do we know that the data is accurate? particularly when it comes to friction. And that's really what this is all about. When you take a cylindrical specimen and you compress it in the test machine, you will always have some amount of friction at interface between the specimen top and bottom surfaces and the surfaces of the loading platens on the test machine. Um, but how big of an influence is that? Is that a big problem you need to worry about or is it not such a big problem? That's what I want to uh, address here in our little video today. So here is a simulation that I performed, it, it turns out it's difficult to prescribe a given friction coefficient experimentally. It's often easier to uh, study this using finite element simulations where we can select the contact conditions and the friction coefficients anywhere we like. So here's a quick little simulation. You see as I compress it, the specimen does not stay straight as a cylinder anymore. The sides of the specimen clearly barrels out during the compression. And that's, that's what happens in experimentally. So if you see an ex one of these tests performed live, that's what you would see. This was a very basic simulation near hook and material model with a friction coefficient of 0 0.1. Um, but we still haven't answered the question, how big of an effect is this? A friction coefficient of 0 0.1 is relatively small after all. So I, I performed this parametric study where I simulated a cylinder that, uh, that initially had a height that was equal to its diameter, and I compressed it to about 30% strain, in, uh, as you can see here. And I did that at different friction coefficients. The black curve is the response when there is no friction. And um, in that case, a cylinder will stay a cylinder as you compress it. But once you start adding a little bit of friction at interfaces, the response will be different, and particularly will be stiffer. And that makes sense. The friction uh, doesn't allow the specimen to move sideways to expand radially as it likes to, so therefore it will take more force to deform it and compress the specimen. So that's why the stresses are larger in magnitude here. And we can see the, the influence here uh, from zero friction up to 0 0.2 in the friction coefficient between these. And that's a relatively big difference in this case. Uh, and so that's um, very important in many cases. So to, to ex explore this a little bit more, I plotted the same data but on the y-axis, I plotted the error between the actual prediction, the actual response when there is no friction, compared to the response when there is a prescribed friction coefficient. So the black curve here has a friction coefficient of 0 0.05. The error increases with engineering strains. So the more I compress it, the, 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 the worse the results get. But it's, it's a relatively weak dependence on strain, and the, this error is about 2%. If my friction coefficient in the test was 0 0.2, but I thought it was 0 when I analyzed the data, then I can expect an error that goes from about 8% to about 11 12% at larger compressive strains. So that's pretty large. A 10% error is certainly not something that I would like to, to see in, in tests. Um, when I do finite element simulations of products in the end, I, I usually try to get the error of my ultimate finite element simulation of whatever I am studying to have an error that's about 10% or lower. And now if I have experimental data that from the start already has 10% error in it, I pretty much is guaranteed, I'm guaranteed not to reach my goal of 10% error in the end. Um, so this can be a problematic uh, thing. And the challenge, of course, is that it's really hard to, to determine what is the friction coefficient in, an, in a real experiment. If you take a specimen, a polymer, you put it in your test machine and you compress it, how do you know what the friction coefficient is? It's not that easy. Um, here's another uh, figure that shows a cross-section of this specimen uh, from a finite element simulation. 
The point here is we can look at the distribution of stresses in the specimen. In this case, the applied strain was minus 0.3. So 30% compression, friction coefficient 0.1. Not this super large friction coefficient, of course, but it's not a zero either. And what we see, which is, I think is fascinating, is that the maximum MISA stress is over five megapascals in this case. And the lowest value we see anywhere is a one, 1 1.2. It's a huge difference between the max and the min stresses in this case. It's clearly not homogeneous, um, even if the friction coefficient is as low as 0 0.1. Um, so that can be something you certainly uh, should worry about. Um, what may, most people perhaps do uh, when they run these experiments is try to lubricate them using oil or Teflon sheets or something like that to try to get the friction coefficient as low as possible. Uh, you can often get it to be less than 0 0.1 for sure, but you can't get it to be zero. And that's the problem we're talking about here. Another thing you can do to help the situation is to try to use larger specimens, taller specimens where the, the ratio of the height to the diameter is a larger number, that helps. You can see in this figure here that uh, the no friction case is a solid black line. And the taller I make the specimen uh, with a given friction coefficient here of 0 0.1, uh, the error goes down. So having a tall specimen is good. You can make it too tall, though, because then the specimen will buckle. So there is a, a, a limit of how far you can go in that regard in, in order to minimize the influence of friction on the experimental uh, results. Another way you can deal with this is, is what I call a, a, a cleaner test, is to use a different specimen geometry. So I used to explore something like this. Here's a simple little uh, geometry that I came up with. You see it's a cylinder that has sort of been uh, uh, has a, a region in the middle that has a lower, smaller diameter. So if we take this specimen and we compress that, uh, there is no surprise that the influence of the friction at the top and bottom interfaces will be much smaller. And in fact, the area here is much, much lower. You can see that between the red and the blue curves, the difference between them is very small and probably can be neglected. The challenge, of course, in a case like this is that it's not a clean, it's a clean test, but it's hard to analyze. So you have to weigh the benefits of data that's accurate, and you know that the boundary conditions are clear, but it's more complicated to analyze it because you need to do an inverse finite element simulation approach to, to handle something like this. The stress and strain is not homogeneous everywhere, but you can clearly work with this if that's something you, you want to deal with. Um, the final thing, back to our initial question, like can, can we get like dissipative behavior? Can we cause viscoelasticity in a in a, in a compression test, what's that all about? Well, let's take a look at this. So we take a specimen like I showed earlier, it's a cylindrical specimen with a friction coefficient of 0 0.1 or 0 0.2 at the interfaces. I compress it, but then I also unload it. And this is, these are pure finite element simulations. There are simulations without stabilization. There is no contact uh, uh, stabilization or anything like that. This is a, a clean, simple contact. And what we see is that of course, as we discussed, the higher the friction it is, the stiffer the response will be during the initial compressive phase of the test, of the simulation. But once we start unloading, we see that the response follows a different curve. And that's because the material sticks to the top and the bottom surfaces. So we do see hysteresis during cyclic loading when we have friction, even though there may not be any. And in this particular case, in my simulation, this is a hyperelastic material model, it's a neo-Hookian one, and there is no dissipative energy. All of this stuff is purely due to the frictional interface effect. It's very interesting. So just because you see uh, that kind of hysteresis in your stress strain curve that you measure experimentally, does not mean, it doesn't prove at least, that you have a uh, viscous material. Um, there is a viscous dissipation, but it could be due to friction. So uh, that also can be shown in the simulation, right? So here's a compression, and you see the barrels out. But now when I unload, if you look carefully, you see that there is a negative barreling during unloading. And that negative barreling is what's causing this uh, hysteresis effect. The specimen actually sucks in in the middle uh, during unloading of, of the of the test cycle.
And that's also something you, all, you can see experimentally if you run these experiments. But you can also see it through simulations, as I showed right here. It's pretty important. So if you deal with these things and you really want to get good results, what can you do? What are the choices you have, right? You can take it. Taller specimen, as we measured. You can try to reduce the friction coefficient. You can also try to address this using M calibration. So M calibration is the software that we developed here at Polymer FEM. It has a specific loading mode or load case called compression with friction, which allows you to say, um, I don't know what my specimen height is, what the diameter is, and how many elements you, you, you want the simulation to be, and what friction coefficient it is. And then M calibration will create an, a finite element model of this specimen geometry. It will be an axisymmetric model and run that for you instead of a single element that it typically does. So this will slow you down a little bit, but it will be clearly more accurate because you have the friction coefficient at the top and bottom interfaces and you can specify the friction coefficient um, that, that was there in the experiment. Um, so this is one way to deal with this. Um, that you can do, and uh, uh, it's certainly important sometimes if you want extra accurate results. So that's something uh, to take a look at if you're interested. So to summarize, if you run compression tests, I, I always say this, record the stress during unloading too. You really need to look at unloading response because it gives you a lot of information. There is no need to stop the test at the maximum compressive deformation state. Go all the way back. If you see hysteresis or energy dissipation in a single cycle, it does not mean that the material is viscoelastic as we showed here. They can be due to frictional effects. But if you run your test very carefully and reduce the friction effect, then any viscous dissipation or hysteresis that you may see is clearly going to be the material uh, behavior that, that you recorded. So I'm not too worried about it, but it's, this is something that's worth being aware of. Uh, since all polymers uh, are certainly viscoelastic, rubbers, thermoplastics, they are viscoelastic or viscoplastic in the response. And, uh, and finally, um, this is something that, that's pretty obvious, but it's always worth thinking about. Uh, running experiments is tricky. There are a lot of things that can go wrong, a lot of things that you should be aware of. Um, but if you do this carefully and you look at the data carefully, you can get excellent material models and you should be able to get good finite element simulations in the end. Uh, so if you have any questions on any of this, uh, head over to Polymer FEM and ask your questions right there. Thank you. Bye.